on air back at it another morning and those joining the chat room good morning to you got a lot to tackle today of course another busy day at the illinois state house you've got gun control advocates that are going to be there today uh, but later on this week gun control opponents going to be taking to springfield for illinois gun owner lobby day we'll talk a bit about that get a preview from one of the board members of the Illinois State Rifle Association. Plus, we got to talk about the latest filing in the U.S. Supreme Court in the case challenging Illinois' gun and magazine ban, the latest filing coming from the state. So we'll discuss that as well. Plus, Governor J.B. Pritzker, he wants $40 million to liquidate the medical debts of certain Illinoisans over four years. I chatted with State Representative Dan Calkins to get his reaction, so we'll share that with you as well. Uh, so a few segments here for you. Uh, stay tuned, a brief breather, and we will be right back with Mandy Ayler from the Illinois State Rifle Association Board about uh, what to expect Thursday for iGold, but also some other events that are coming up. So stay tuned, that's on the way here with Bishop On Air. Thousands of Illinois gun owners could descend on Springfield Thursday for Illinois Gun Owner Lobby Day. It's an annual event, and as is indication from those who tune into this channel, uh, there's a lot of people thirsty for knowledge and for uh, an understanding of what's going on with their gun rights. And one organization that does that here in Illinois to, to give that information is the Illinois State Rifle Association. And a board member joining me now, Mandy Ayler. She is with the Illinois State Rifle Association board uh, to talk about some of what's uh, expected for Thursday with iGold coming to town, but also some other events coming up this summer uh, that we want to tell you about. Uh, but Mandy, thanks for taking time with us this morning. How are you doing? I'm fantastic. Thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate being on. Absolutely. So uh, obviously iGold's a big day, uh, potentially thousands of people. Uh, I remember seeing it back in what, 2011, uh, where there were, uh, geez, like, I don't even know how many thousand, like seven or 8,000 people. Uh, but clearly yeah. there's there's an interest in Illinois uh, for people to, to know what's happening with their Second Amendment rights. Um, but before we get to that, uh, we do have um, some uh, gun control advocates that are going to be in Springfield today. Every town, Moms Demand Action, uh, they're planning a rally. Uh, I'm curious if you were there today, uh, what would your message be to those organizations? Honestly, the message to those organizations is that they're 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 misplaced. They really are. They think that they're providing a good service. They think that they're doing the right thing, but they're just not. Um, they are very misinformed. And I think that's part of the biggest problem with a lot of this stuff is the misinformation that's out there. Um, we have people that are making laws that don't understand firearms, that don't understand actually what they're restricting or what they're even talking about. Um, and it's the same thing with a lot of these groups. They they don't understand or the information that they're passing on isn't correct. And so I think that that's probably the biggest thing is the fact checking needs to go on and it just it doesn't happen. What would you say are some of the uh, biggest things they misunderstand uh, when it comes to the Second Amendment and why people would want to own firearms? You know, I think the biggest thing is that they don't understand that firearms, it's it's your right. You're you're an American, period, that we don't need another reason in this country. We just don't. But the reality of it is, is that we want to be able to protect ourselves. And the fact that you're trying to limit me from protecting myself, however, I find necessary. It's not it's 
it goes against everything that we believe in in this country. It just does that I, I'm supposed to be limited on what I can have in my own home to protect myself and my family. That's it's not appropriate. It's just not. And it's it's wrong. It goes against the Second Amendment. It goes against our Constitution. It goes against everything that we believe. So clearly uh, a lot's going to be said this week about firearms. And uh, we've even had conversations about, you know, the the, the, the measure that they want to spend three and a half million dollars to tell people to lock their guns up and different types of bills that have been proposed about more training and that training has to be state sanctioned and more background checks and so on. Uh, but how would you assess the current state of of the Second Amendment in the state of Illinois. In this, what Second Amendment in the state of Illinois? It's like they've forgotten what it even means. They they've forgotten to read their constitution. Um, they all every law um, every person that's in government actually took an oath to uphold our constitution, and all of them hit, need to go back and reread it because they are completely misguided as to what can be restricted and what can't. We're talking with Mandy Ayler. She is the uh, board member with the Illinois State Rifle Association. Uh, and, of course, Illinois Gun Owner Lobby Day coming up Thursday. Uh, it's going to be a, an interesting uh, turnout uh, as we've got the legislature in session, both chambers. Uh, talk about the significance of Gun Owner Lobby Day. What do you guys hope to accomplish? We're really hoping that we have big numbers. You know, the biggest thing that we can do is show up and, and honestly show our, our legislators and show our senators that we actually do show up, which means we're also going to show up at the polls. We vote. Um, and so if they're not doing what's in our best interest, we're going to vote them out. And I'm really hoping that they understand that it's it really is. They work for us. And I, I feel like our government forgets that sometimes. And so I'm really hoping that we have a huge turnout and that the, the message gets brought that we're going to be at the polling places that we are going to be voting. So make sure that you're actually listening to us and, and voting in our best interest. So clearly a, a full day of events, uh, including at the Bank of Springfield Center in Springfield, uh, where Alan Gottlieb uh, from the Second Amendment Foundation, long time. I mean, he's been uh, fighting for uh, Second Amendment issues for decades. Uh, what do you hope to hear from him? We're excited to hear from him. We are excited for what message he's going to bring to us. Um, I'm honestly, I, I really hope he just brings a words of encouragement. You know, I think in Illinois, we get very, very down and it gets really hard and everybody wants to say that, oh, there's nothing we can do. So it's I, I really hope that he brings the words of encouragement because the plain fact is that you can sit home and say that, oh, I, if, we, if I do nothing, it's it doesn't matter. But it does. It really, really does. And oh, we need thousands of people to show up. Well, it takes all of you to show up so that we can get those thousands to show up. So it really is. I hope that he gives some encouragement and I hope that it, it really does bring a call to action to make more people call their legislators, actually take some action and, and make sure that they are passing the bills that we want and they're opposing the bills that we want that we don't want. So after the uh, event at the Bank of Springfield Center, there's a, uh, a parade of sorts through the streets yeah. of Springfield uh, heading to the Capitol. And I think one of the, uh, the most iconic things anybody can see is, regardless of whatever the issue is, if you've got hundreds, if not thousands of people marching down the streets with the Capitol in the background, I mean, that, that's, uh, that, that's pretty remarkable. It sends quite a message. It really does. And so that's the big thing is that we need the people to show up so that that way when we are marching to Springfield, when they are looking out their office doors, they see us all coming down the street and there is a large number of us. That's what makes the impact. So we are really, really hoping to get a big, big group out there this week. For those who are planning on heading down to uh, Illinois Gun Owner Lobby Day, uh, and they do plan on trying to connect with their legislators, uh, how should they approach them? So the biggest thing is they have to be respectful. You know, I think that's probably going to be the biggest thing is being respectful, not yelling. Um, that doesn't get anybody anywhere. It really, really doesn't. We need to make sure that everybody stays respectful, brings the message correctly. Um, the the yelling and the rhetoric and the and getting into um, getting too far into it sometimes that brings the wrong message. We want to make sure that we're bringing the right message that we're peaceful. We're we're not the the crazy people that they might think that we are as gun owners. Um, I want to make sure that everybody does stay just respectful and peaceful throughout the day and that we can have good, constructive conversation with our legislators. With that, uh, how do you get somebody uh, like, you know, a suburban Democrat legislator or a Chicago Democratic legislator? How do you uh, what, what would you say uh, to say somebody like uh, State Representative Bob Morgan, who ushered in the ban on semi-automatic firearms in the state? 
You know, I think the question is that we have to ask them where they're coming from and asking them what they think they're accomplishing with these bills. And I think that we need to bring them the facts of what it what it is and what it isn't actually doing, what it has the potential to accomplish and what it doesn't have the potential to accomplish. You know, I think that they they sit there and they listen to very much so one side of the coin. Um, and so they have a very different image of what they're actually passing and, the, and how it's actually going to protect anybody. So I think that the big thing is just is getting the information out there, giving them the education. And, and I know it's hard. Believe me, I get it because I know that they, they don't want to listen to us. They really don't. Um, but I think starting the conversation and just having an open conversation about it is, is the best way to go. It's, it's the first thing that needs to happen. Illinois State Rifle Association board member Mandy Ayler with us. Uh, Mandy, how did you get into this space of, uh, you know, you're a woman in the Second yeah. Amendment community. You're on the board of the State Rifle Association. How did you uh, w what started this path for you? So to be very honest, the whole thing that started it was actually my dad just asking me to go to the range. Um, I only started shooting less than 10 years ago. It wasn't something that was my my father's been a shooter pretty much his whole life. He's always been in competitions and different things. Um, and about eight years ago, nine years ago, he asked me to go to the range. And I said, yeah, why not? I went to the range with him. I got my FOID card, got my concealed carry. Um, and to be honest, I started looking for a female instructor. I started looking for somebody in my area that I could go to that I could actually start learning from. And I had a problem finding her. Um, so I I kind of became her. I decided to do a lot of training. I did an insane amount of training. I went to the range a lot. I've gone to a lot of different schools. I've been to Gunsight. Um, I've trained with Masada Ayub. So I've done a lot of different training in my short amount of time. Um, and I've gotten quite a few certificates under my belt for teaching and different things. And the next kind of path just seemed like advocacy was the right thing. Um, so I actually got involved with a group called Women for Gun Rights. Um, we are actually going to be down in Springfield on Wednesday talking to some of our legislators. We have some appointments set up and we'll be down there speaking to them before I gold. Um, and it just it kind of just was the natural path. I got involved with the Illinois State Rifle Association, um, teaching some classes and doing some things with them. I run a, a organization called Armed Women of America. So we meet we're a monthly group that meets once a month. Um, I got involved with that. And the next kind of path just seemed to get into the advocacy and to make sure that the organization was still going in the right direction. So it just seemed like the natural path to kind of take. You've got an event coming up uh, this summer uh, that's uh, free and open uh, for women who are interested in the Second Amendment. Uh, tell us about that. Yeah, I'm very excited about this event. So the whole thing originally started. There is a gentleman up in Detroit. His name is Rick Ector. He's actually on the NRA Board of Directors. Um, about 12 years ago, he started an event for women where it was a totally free event. They could come in, learn how to shoot from a qualified instructor and go home. Um, he has been fortunate enough to train quite a few people in his time. So he's been doing it for about 12 years and he has trained a total of almost 9,000 women. So I'm hoping to get to that someday. So the whole premise of it basically is they're going to come in they will come into the classroom and we're going to talk safety and we're going to talk firearm basics for about an hour. So they'll get a nice little lesson there and then they're going to head out to the range and they are going to learn from a qualified female instructor how to shoot. Um, they All the firearms have been donated for us to use for the day. I have gotten an NRA grant and IRSRA has also donated so that we have enough ammunition to cover the entire day for the women. Um, all of the ear protection, the eye protection, everything has been donated either from the NRA or the Illinois State Rifle Association. So we have had a wonderful, wonderful response to this. Um, it's going to be a lot of fun. I am really, really looking forward to it. We are hoping to train about 250 women that day. Um, I right now have 12 female instructors that have committed to the day, as well as uh, multiple RSOs and other support staff. We're looking at uh, a flyer of sorts, says uh, June 15th, a Saturday at the Illinois State Rifle Association range in Bonfield. And uh, it's empowering first shots free women's shooting event. Uh, where can people get more information about this other than looking at the uh, the, the flyer here? I'm, I'm flashing on the screen. Um, <laughs> can they uh, can they just uh, check out the State Rifle Association's page or where's the best place to find that? Best place to find it is actually going to be on Eventbrite. I started the whole thing on Eventbrite, not knowing exactly how this was all going to go to start with. Um, so if they go to Eventbrite, they can find it right on Empowering First Shots. Um, I also believe if they go on to the Illinois State Rifle Association calendar, there is a link for the Eventbrite on there as well. Mandy, thank you so much for taking time with us this morning uh, from the Illinois State Rifle Association. You are a board member there. Uh, you're going to be in town Wednesday and then also Thursday for iGold, so I greatly appreciate you being here. And uh, maybe I'll see you on the ground in Springfield when you get here. It'd be right? nice. 
Absolutely. Thanks, Greg. Appreciate right. it. Have a great day. It is Bishop on Air here. I'm Greg Bishop. Thanks for hanging out. And again, thanks to Mandy for taking time with us here with Bishop on Air. All right. Uh, stay tuned. We've got plenty more uh, to tackle, including the latest in filings against the state's gun ban. But the state is the one filing the latest. So we'll get to that coming up here with Bishop on Air. Uh, like, subscribe, hit that notification bell for the latest. All right. Make it happen. Illinois filing a response to the U.S. Supreme Court in the challenge against Illinois' gun and magazine ban. Welcome back, Bishop on Air. I'm Greg Bishop. Thanks for hanging out. And if you pull up the Illinois Supreme Court docket for Barnett v. Raul, uh, you'll see this where you've got, uh, of course, the original docketing date, uh, February 14th, when the plaintiffs in this case uh, shook the ruling from the Seventh Circuit U.S. Court of Appeals to the U.S. Supreme Court and said, we want you to step in and review this. Uh, so uh, they filed February 12th. Uh, then you had amicus briefs being filed by the State Rifle Association. We talked about that. We also discussed all of the different uh, states that have filed uh, in support of the plaintiffs asking for the Supreme Court to take up this particular challenge. Uh, then you get, uh, you know, the American Firearms Association filed an amicus brief. Uh, but yesterday, uh, a brief from Cook County, Tony Preckwinkle, the president of Cook County. Uh, you've also got Kim Fox and Tom Dart uh, out of Cook County. Uh, Kim Fox being the uh, the state's attorney, Tom Dart being the sheriff. Uh, and also a filing from Kwame Raoul, Brendan Kelly, and J.B. Pritzker uh, opposing what was submitted. So let's take a look first at uh, what the uh, Cook County officials had to post uh, in their filing. And uh, it's 54 pages long. Uh, we'll just see if they give us a bit of uh, uh, an overview here with, uh, with a uh, table of contents. Uh, as we uh, look at this in the question presented, this is State Rifle Association v. Bruin out of New York announced a two-step inquiry uh, governing Second Amendment challenges. The first step, the plaintiffs must demonstrate the government action being challenged contradicts the Second Amendment's text. When conducting that textual analysis, Bruin expressly considered whether the regulated weapons were in common use for a lawful purpose. At the second step, the, bur the burden shifts to the government to show that its actions are nevertheless constitutional because they are consistent with the nation's history and traditions of firearm regulation. Questions that uh, the Cook County officials say are presented, whether petitioners have shown that Cook County's regulations of assault weapons and high capacity magazines contradicts the Second Amendment's text, where they offer no admissible evidence that assault weapons or high capacity magazines are in common use for any lawful purpose. This Cook County officials claim. And the other question presented, whether Cook County's regulations consistent with the nation's history and tradition, where it's undisputed that governments, they say, have long carefully regulated access to weapons incompatible with the ancient English common law principle of moderate proportional self-defense. So they're going to, uh, you know, common law for what uh, proportional self-defense is. Uh, so, you know, looking at their table of contents, uh, they say the case is a poor vehicle for the various questions presented. Uh, no conflicts warrants immediate review and no extraordinary circumstances warrants review. So uh, that's uh, pretty much their conclusion, again, from uh, Cook County when it comes to the filing to the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, but then you've got uh, the, the state of Illinois uh, with their filing. Kwame Raoul, the attorney general, Brendan Kelly, the director of Illinois State Police, J.B. Pritzker, the governor of Illinois. Here's what their filing has to say in front of the U.S. Supreme Court. 
Uh, and again, uh, you'll see, you know, the questions presented uh, and says whether petitioners are entitled to a preliminary injunction on their claim. The state and law local laws restrict civilian possession of assault weapons and large capacity ammunition feeding devices violates the Second Amendment. Uh, their table of contents says that uh, this case does not satisfy the criteria for certiorari. There's no division of authority to the question presented. Uh, the interlocutory nature of the Seventh Circuit's decision makes this a poor vehicle to decide the question presented. Uh, the court should reject petitioner's request that it departs from the usual certiorari criteria. Uh, they also say the decision below is consistent with Heller and Bruin, that the decision being the preliminary decision from the Seventh Circuit U.S. Court of Appeals. Uh, the assault weapons and large capacity magazines, LCMs, are not arms protected by the Second Amendment, the state claims, and the challenged laws are consistent with historical tradition. Petitioner's arguments are not persuasive, they claim. And uh, if you want, you can go and see all this yourself uh, and read the 47 some odd pages uh, from the state's filing here uh, when it comes to whether or not the U.S. Supreme Court should take up this case. And again, uh, you know, this this was filed uh, to the U.S. Supreme Court uh, back in February. All right. Back in February. Uh, and here we are now in April, and we're getting a response from the state. Uh, when will we know if the U.S. Supreme Court's going to take this case, especially considering you've got a lot of different states, like 29 different states or something, uh, that have uh, said that uh, the Supreme Court needs to take this case, that this is the case to deal with this issue, uh, let alone so many of the other cases that there are uh, that could be going all the way to, uh, you know, for instance, um, other states that have bans on on semi-automatic firearms uh, what was it colorado uh they're getting ready to to approve a ban on semi-automatic firearms uh you've got uh several other states that are moving forward as well with such things so uh clearly this is an issue that uh, is going to have to be addressed at some point when will the u.s supreme court address it not sure uh and since we don't know when the u.s supreme court's going to address it we've got to uh just i guess look at the Southern District of Illinois and uh, is the Southern District of Illinois uh, where Judge Stephen McGlynn has the, um, you know, the uh, case possibly going to trial come uh, July 8th, as we heard from Attorney Thomas Mag yesterday. Uh, that's on the merits. It's not on preliminary issues because even the request to the U.S. Supreme Court is on preliminary issues. So it's possible and again, I'm not an attorney. I'm just I'm just a reporter uh, <laughs> practicing my First Amendment uh, on a daily basis uh, you know, as, a, as a member of the free press um, and having watched these things for, for years now. Uh, it's entirely possible that the U.S. Supreme Court says they're not going to take this case on a preliminary issue. And that makes the Southern District of Illinois federal case that much more important because it's no longer on preliminary issues. It is on the merits of whether or not states can ban certain types of firearms uh, so clearly there's a lot more to be said about all of this and uh, we will be watching it uh, together right here with bishop on air so i appreciate you guys being here uh, each and every weekday morning and uh, be sure to like subscribe and hit that notification bell all right let's make it happen Randall, I do not have a microphone permit. Except, you know, I do have a press badge. Uh, that's a, another story entirely. Governor J.B. Pritzker wants to spend $40 million in taxpayer funds over four years in an effort he says will eliminate the medical debt for certain Illinoisans and the total amounts that could be liquidated, $4 billion. 
he claims. Welcome back. It's Bishop on Air. I'm Greg Bishop. Thanks for hanging out. Uh, of course, uh, full time, I'm over at the Illinois State House uh, with uh, with legislators coming in and tracking state governments. Follow the center square. You can find not just stories from Illinois' state house. You can find stories from Missouri's state house, from Iowa state house, from California and New York and Washington state and Philadelphia. It's all over the place. Go to thecentersquare.com and find your state. Uh, but a lot of you are living in Illinois, and uh, you can go to thecentersquare.com slash Illinois and uh, read up what's going on. A uh, lot's happening. So uh, back in February, Governor J.B. Pritzker, he delivered his state of the state and budget address, a uh, combined speech where he talked about his priorities, his goals, uh, and what he wants to make happen in the budget. Uh, one thing covering state governments for almost 10 straight years now, uh, you always hear that uh, the, the budget is a moral document. It's a document that legislators spell out their priorities. It's a document that the governor spells out his priorities. And it's, you know, something that is very important. It's your tax dollars at work. How are your tax dollars going to be prioritized? Uh, and uh, over the past seven years or so, I've seen the budget increase quite a bit. I remember when the budget was $38 billion and people are like, wow, it's a lot of money. And then it was $42 billion and then it was $45 billion and then it was close to 50. Now the governor's proposing to spend $53 billion and uh, a lot of that spending uh, going to pensions, a lot of that spending going to K through 12 schools, a lot of that spending going towards uh, you know, uh, employing state agencies uh, and so on. Uh, then you've got the spending for roads and infrastructure and public safety. Uh, but also you've got the spending that's for the non-citizen migrants. Uh, and that's another issue that uh, we're going to hear a lot more about this week, especially with the city of Chicago looking to approve 70 million more dollars uh, of city taxpayer funds. And that would be on top of 70 million dollars from Cook County taxpayer funds on top of, I think it's 182 or 183 million dollars that Governor J.B. Pritzker is proposing for the next fiscal year for direct assistance to migrants. That doesn't count the 600 and some odd million dollars for uh, non-citizen health care that taxpayers subsidize. Uh, so you've got all those costs in this budget. But another thing that the governor wants to do is he wants to uh, take $40 million over four years. So $10 million a year. And he wants to hook up with a company uh, that is a nonprofit, a national nonprofit that uh, aims at helping people get rid of their medical debts. Here is the governor talking a bit uh, about uh, his his proposal to use taxpayer funds to alleviate medical debt. Uh, as many of you know, health care debt is a uniquely American issue. Uh, we want the best and safest options. We want a fair shot at a healthy life. But after the care ends for that circumstance, many walk away with unexpected pain. Not only the emotional and physical toll of the crisis that they've been through, but a serious financial toll too. Too many patients leave hospitals with their credit ruined or at risk of bankruptcy in the ensuing months. Over, uh, sorry, often through no fault of their own. And here in Illinois, 14% of our population has medical debt in default. On top of that, we see significant racial disparities with nearly 20% of communities of color in Illinois experiencing extreme medical debt. It's preventing individuals and families from attaining financial stability. And research shows it's also having day-to-day -day impacts for all the affected individuals like emotional distress and difficulty meeting basic needs. So the governor talks about studies uh, that have been done, uh, saying that uh, the studies have shown that this can alleviate a variety of things from you know, people's mental health issues. However, uh, when you look at a study that was published this week, uh, this month, from the National Bureau of Economic Research, uh, let's go ahead and pull that up where you've got uh, the, the Bureau uh, talking about uh, you know what they did here and the abstracts. It's kind of like an overview, right? It says two in five Americans have medical debt, nearly half of whom owe at least $2,500. Concerned by the burden, governments and private donors have undertaken large high-profile efforts to relieve medical debts. 
we partnered with RIP Medical Debt, which is actually, that's the company that Governor J.B. Pritzker wants to hook up with here. They've changed their name. Uh, it's no longer uh, RIP Medical Debt. Uh, it is now, uh, I'm trying to see if I can find the, the name here really quick. Um, Undo Medical Debt. So formerly RIP Medical Debt, and now uh, they're calling themselves undo medical debt. Uh, so regardless, uh, back to this, uh, this study from the uh, National uh, Bureau of Economic Research, uh, they spell out in their abstract that uh, we partnered with RIP Medical Debt to conduct two randomized experiments that relieved medical debt with a face value of 169 million for 83,000 people between 2018 and 2020. We track outcomes using credit reports, collections account data, and a multimodal survey. There are three sets of results. First, we find no impact of debt relief on credit access, utilization, and financial distress on average. So they find no impact on debt relief when it comes to credit access, utilization, and financial distress. Second, they do estimate that the debt relief causes a moderate but statistically significant reduction in payment of existing medical debt. And then third, we find no effect of medical debt relief on mental health on average with dementia, uh, determinal uh, effects for some groups in pre-registered uh, analysis. So you've got, you've got again, a study here uh, saying that hey, there's, on average, not really much relief when it comes to credit access, utilization, and financial distress, and uh, no effect on mental health on average. Uh, I, Governor J.B. Pritzker asked about that study uh, yesterday when he was talking about this particular proposal he has to eliminate medical debt using taxpayer funds. First of all, that study was done, as you know, in 2018, 2019, 2020, uh, and a lot has changed. You know, the, as I mentioned earlier in my remarks, uh, the organization Undo Medical Debt uh, has done a lot to change their program. They started out as a startup back in 2014 and got going really um, more significantly in 2016. And then as the pandemic hit, uh, there was even more opportunity and different ways in which you could alleviate medical debt uh, for people. And so now here we are in 2024, the program has evolved even more. So I think the results of that are not indicative of, for example, the results of the pro the uh, research that's been done since then. So the governor uh, seeming to downplay this research, saying it's old data. I mean, but it's data from 2018 and 2020. Uh, I connected with uh, State Representative Dan Calkins, a Republican from Decatur, uh, and got his reaction to this, and also the, the study that seems to contradict uh, what the governor hopes the goal would uh, produce of relieving and liquidating medical debts. This is this is another one of these issues just like student debt that we're going to forgive. I understand, you know, that it, it is difficult uh, to uh, have medical debt, but uh, 10 million dollars into this program doesn't begin to touch, um, you know, where we are and it's not really going to help people's credit. So, um, you know, pro you know our, pro our priorities, we need to look at our priorities. We have a Fifty billion dollars. We don't know how it's going to get spent, but uh, every every agency that's come before us has asked for a 10, 12 percent increase in their budget. I don't see where it comes from. It's going to be very interesting this year uh, how we actually balance this budget. Uh, and I don't think this this is going to go anywhere. So again, uh, Conkin is saying that uh, all he's seen from state agencies is r increased asks for more money. Uh, and it, there's going to be interesting to see how they squeeze out $10 million for this program. Uh, you've also got uh, the uh, increased cost from a new state agency the governor's talking about, $13 million. Uh, and that's for an agency that's going to take uh, early childhood programs and put them into one. Uh, but regardless, new programs, uh, we keep hearing about new programs for spending uh, tax dollars. Uh, but again, the, the study here from the uh, national, um, what is, what's the group called? Uh, the, na 
The National Bureau of Economic Research, uh, again, spelling out that uh, they estimate uh, no impact on debt relief on credit access, utilization of financial distress, and uh, no effect on medical debt relief on mental health on average. Uh, Calkins reacting to that as well. The, the research is, is factual. The governor is trying to pander. Uh, I know he's still interested in a political career outside of Illinois, and this is just another one of those Democrat talking points will forgive everybody's debt if you vote for me. Uh, it's not going to work. This isn't the right answer. Uh, and you're correct. It does not solve your credit problems, nor does it really address the mental health issues that we have. So, again, uh, interesting to, to kind of hear the back and forth here. We've still got... Uh, a month and a half or so before the legislature has to approve a budget. Will this particular element make it into the budget? That's a great question. And if you stay tuned with Bishop on air, we'll definitely revisit that. So uh, like, subscribe, hit that notification bell. Appreciate you guys being here uh, and sounding off. Uh, the chat room is, is lively, guys. My gosh. All right. Be, be kind. All right. That's, that's all I ask for. It's just be kind. All right. Have yourselves a wonderful rest of the day. Uh, be sure to like, subscribe, hit that notification bell. Follow me on X. Uh, just search Bishop on air. You can also find all the work that um, uh, my team and I put together at thecentersquare.com slash Illinois. So make it happen. All right. All right, guys, uh, appreciate your time as always. Uh, thanks for being here. Uh, and uh, I got to get out of here, head back to the state house, and we'll watch uh, a whole bunch more action. Uh, they're in the, some deadlines, so stuff's going to be flying out of the house. Uh, there were like uh, a couple of dozen bills that passed yesterday. Uh, there are uh, legislative priorities that are going to be discussed uh, and a whole bunch more. So you guys have yourselves a great day. We'll be back here tomorrow with Bishop on Air.